Thank you for having us here today. My name is Paul Kelly. My name is Jean Lin. We're biomedical communicators at the Toronto Video Atlas of Surgery. And today we'd like to talk about using video to illustrate surgical stories. There is a seemingly endless number of surgical videos online, but high quality content is not always easy to come across. Most of the surgical videos we watch as references are not edited with education and design principles we know to be effective as medical illustrators. We've been making surgical videos that combine surgical footage and 3D animation for a number of years, and we get a lot of positive feedback on our content. So we'd like to share some of the principles which have guided the development of TVA Surge. I think it's safe to say that video production requires some special considerations that make a big difference. Working with surgeons has its own considerations as well. Not only do we work with raw footage from very long surgeries, but we also have to navigate content experts with very tight schedules. Proper planning is essential. So let's dive into the fundamentals of video editing for surgical storytelling. Before we start, we should probably mention that we will be showing some graphic images from the surgery. So just a heads up. We'll begin by going over how we deal with editing our raw footage. We have been filming surgeries for about a decade now, and the cases can go quite long. We usually start around eight o'clock in the morning and may not get out until later in the evening. Luckily, not all our cases take that long, but it's not uncommon to be dealing with eight to 14 hours of footage for one case. The target runtime for our video is around 10 to 15 minutes which means we have to deal with managing and editing a large amount of raw footage. Having dealt with these projects over several years, we've developed some strategies we can share for being more efficient in the video editing process. I think the first thing we should talk about is the notes we take in the OR when we're filming. The cameras are going to be sterile, so we can't touch them, but we are still very active when we're filming. We always have to keep an eye on the cameras to make sure we're capturing the action and taking a lot of notes so that we know when the important moments in the procedure happen. We use a combination of recording the exact time an event took place on the clock, but also noting the timestamp from the video monitor as well, which can be a much faster way to navigate to that part of the footage when editing. Using the timestamps from the OR notes, we are able to quickly scrub through the raw footage and find the key shots we need. As an example here, the markers indicate where the important surgical steps happen. We then assemble all the key shots in sequential order with minimal editing and compile them into a rough cut. This is the first video draft we will share with the surgeons for discussion. To make it easier for review, we typically want to keep this draft to around 10 minutes. Even with our OR notes of the timestamps, there's still going to be a lot of scrubbing or moving the playhead back and forth quickly over the footage to identify precisely where a step happened. Scrubbing through HD footage can get really laggy. So a good way to make this easier is to use video proxies, which are low res duplicates you use for editing. When you're done editing the raw footage, these can then be swapped out for the high res footage for rendering. So in this example, you see the low res proxy in relation to the high res source footage. If I scaled this up to 200%, it would fill the same size of the premiere sequence. It will be pixelated, but I can edit it with much faster performance. It's also important to keep a consistent file structure throughout the project. We have used the same folder structure for several years. So on every project, we always know where the footage will be linked. For longer cases, we have multiple memory cards with multiple clips on each card. It's crucial to make sure we stay organized with the order of clips and which camera angle they are filmed. We would like to share some unique challenges we face with surgical video storytelling and some considerations and solutions we have developed one of the challenges is there can be many important surgical steps. We have to figure out how to help our audience digest all this information. So what we try to do is chunk this information into just a few chapters 
that each contain just a few sequences. Often we will write up a case outline before we even start filming. So we have an idea of what to look for when we're in the OR. At this point, we're still learning the procedure. So this is also a good way to generate questions for the surgeon before we have review meetings. After filming and producing a rough draft, we'll have a much better idea of how to group each of these steps based on what we saw and how we noticed the surgeons behaving when certain steps were complete. The first draft of the outline will almost always have changed because the order the steps were done in can change a little bit each time the procedure is done. It's depending on the specific patient and their anatomy. This outline will not only help to organize the script and video production files, but will seamlessly transition to the chapters of the video's subtitle screens and the timestamps on the video case page for quick navigation. In some procedures, there are critical steps that can be grouped under one chapter subtitle to make the total number of chapters less, but the steps are important enough to each warrant their own timestamp link. When the video reaches that chapter, we'll expand the subtitles to show the additional steps. This helps to reduce the cognitive load on the viewer while they're watching the video to keep that chapter list as short as possible making it easier to remember the sequence of the procedure for trainees. So Gene, what do we do when we look at that outline and there's just still too much information to fit into one video? We want to keep the viewers engaged and not overwhelm them with an hour long video. One simple way we have done is to find a suitable break point and section the video in two parts such as the example here of a very complex Whipple procedure. We decided to focus the first video on dissection and transection, and the second video about the reconstruction process. Another situation is when there are special surgical techniques that requires a lot of explanation. To include all the detail in one video, will make the video very long and out of focus. So what we have done is to create an overview video for the whole procedure and additional videos to highlight certain techniques. For example, the technique for reconstructing the vessels in pediatric patients are very unique and requires lots of considerations. So we created standalone videos for artery and portal vein reconstruction. This way, the overview video can give viewers a clear grasp on the whole procedure. Then they can dive into each specific technique for more detail if they are interested. When I first started working at TVS Surge, what I found the most challenging is to wrap my head around the surgical anatomy. It's just so different from what we have learned in textbook. We have also chatted with many residents and they often express the difficulty of understanding anatomical structures they are seeing in the OR. So we have always paid extra attention to orient our viewers to the anatomy in the footage. Well, one of the best ways we found to get really good footage to teach with is during our filmmaking to ask the surgeons to give us a demo whenever we've noticed that they've finished dissecting or completed a major step or when we can tell that they're about to cut something and make sure it's captured clearly for the camera. So this example is from a total pancreatectomy with portal vein reconstruction. And you can see how the surgeon demonstrated this dissection for us. Now, in cases where there are a lot of vessels nearby one another and several reconstructions to be performed later, having multiple demo shots throughout the recording helps so that you can jump back and forth and reorient. You just have to remember to ask the surgeons for the demo when you notice there's an opportunity. Another tactic is to use 3D renders or 2D graphic overlays on the footage. We'll hold a freeze frame of the video and composite an illustration with transparent background over it. This adds a great deal of educational quality to the video because the overlays help the viewer understand what they are looking at 
by clearly delineating the edges between separate structures using color-coded anatomy conventions. Animations can be especially helpful for orientation in laparoscopic videos because this camera is zoomed in so closely to the anatomy that you don't have any nearby structures to use as guideposts to triangulate your position. So bringing in the animation overlays or the demo shots can remind the viewer of where they are and what structures on screen they're looking at. Of course, this technique depends on us being able to at least see enough of the anatomy clearly in the shot to align our illustrations with it. But what about the shots that are difficult to obtain in the first place, Jean? Because the surgical field is narrow and usually with many pairs of hands operating, Quite often, the surgeon's hand can block the camera. For example, a key step of dividing a small vessel is blocked here. We have to instruct surgeons to position their hands slightly away from the camera to get a clear shot. Sometimes, we also need to instruct the surgeons to reposition the camera for a better angle. And depending on the case, we have also experimented with filming equipment that allows more flexibility, such as a monopod. With the head and neck cases, the visibility of the surgical field shifts more, and it would be impossible to have a fixed camera over the operating table. Using a monopod allows us to hold the camera higher and also move according to surgeon's action. Even with that, there are just situations where certain footage is impossible to obtain, either because the angle is too limited or surgeons are performing the action just by feeling with their hands. In this case, the pathological liver was too big to get a good shot of the umbilical tape placement. So we used 3D models to show the relationship of the tape to the liver and the hepatic veins. With animation, we can show steps that could never be filmed. There are also times where we have great footage, but we decide to cut it down. We have to pay attention to the pacing of each step so the story is not out of focus. The most important steps can be very quick, such as dividing vessels, and there may be steps that take a long time to complete, like certain parts of the dissection, but they are not that critical to show in detail. Very true. Even when a step is important and we've got good footage of it from start to end, it might just take too long to show because there's a lot of movement going on that isn't important to see, like in the suturing example shown here. So this is a demonstration from a hepatic artery aneurysm resection case. And after they've resected the aneurysm, they're going to be suturing up the portion of the artery that was opened up. And that can just go on and on, right? Even if you speed up the footage, there's a lot of unnecessary movement here. It's, it's not necessary for the viewer to see the same action repeated over and over and over again. So usually what we'll do is we just show the first and the last stitch and maybe one in the middle just for showing the progression. So those are cases where we've removed otherwise good footage because it didn't fit the needs of the narrative. But sometimes there are cases where we identify a need to add more to the narrative. We've talked a lot about the how, but from an educational standpoint, we also have opportunities to explain the why they have certain steps in the surgical plan. A great example is shown here. We wanted to demonstrate why it was okay to divide the inferior vena cava without reconstructing it. Since the tumor has blocked the vena cava, the venous blood flow has rerouted through the collateral vessels. We introduce an animation here to show the blood now drains from the common iliac vein to the ascending lumbar vein, bypassing inferior vena cava. Because the surgical field is usually quite complex, viewers can easily get lost and not know where to look at. 
We also implement some design strategies to help directing the viewer's focus. Yeah, so one simple trick we often use is to simply zoom in on the footage. High definition cameras, which record at 1920 by 1080 pixels, are becoming more common in ORs. And for the web, we usually export to the older 1280 by 720 HD format. And this gives us some wiggle room to adjust the framing. Adjusting the scale and position of the frame also allows us to better transition from shot to shot so that the area of important action overlaps. And this then means that the viewer's eye doesn't have to refocus each time there's a cut. We don't want to alter our footage so much that it hurts the accuracy, but we do adjust the color balance, exposure, and contrast to make the structures in the shot as clear as possible. For example, you can see in this shot, the surgical footage comes out a little bit red. So we adjust the color to make the structure more clear. We also use masks to adjust the lighting in the footage to help reorient the viewers to the part we want them to look at, such as clamping the superhepatic cava shown here. These adjustments are analogous to retopologizing 3D models from CT scans. We don't think this compromises the accuracy of the source footage. If you look at the RGB waveforms beneath the image, you'll notice the red channel is actually blown out to the top of the waveform on the left, whereas on the right, the RGB waveforms are actually more in sync. Now, surgeons just don't have time for long review meetings, so we always want to make sure they're getting the most out of each one. Also, we try to keep in mind that while we are trying to learn the surgical procedure, the surgeons are also trying to learn the video production process as well. They try to make things easy for us to learn the surgery, and we try to make things easy for them to see how the video is progressing. We always try to find ways to make the review process easier for the surgeons. After having initial meeting to sort out the key steps and important surgical considerations, we prepare a draft script and storyboard with sketches and screenshots from the footage. This way, they can modify and edit a draft script instead of having to create things from scratch. At the same time, visualize what the animation will look like in the end. Ultimately, when we're starting out a surgical video, we want to get that rough cut ready early on to discuss project scope, focus, and key surgical steps. We want the surgeon to be able to see how it's taking shape and where it's going. To help us do this, on that rough cut, we'll try to include automated robo audio for the pacing and to keep the surgeon engaged with editing. We also have a video review software called Collaborate, which we use to share our work in progress videos with surgeons and track draft versions. We have this on our local server, so there's less security concerns. This way, surgeons can comment and draw on the freeze frames of the video, all of which is time stamped for us. And then we can download that and use it for editing the next draft. So those are a collection of tips and reflections on our experience of making surgical teaching videos. If you check out tvasurge.ca, you can see our library of work. And please check out our blog section as well, which we also update every month where you can learn more about our process and the tools we use. Of particular note, you might want to check out our most recent blog post on using DaVinci Resolve for surgical video editing written by my colleague here, Gene. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact us.